Hello. Welcome to Reading Paul's Mail. This is our eighth podcast, and as I was preparing for the podcast today, I noticed that we're about three-fourths of the way through Paul's epistle, letter to the Romans. And as I was studying what we're going to be covering tonight, I also noticed that it looks like everything that Paul has said up to this point in time has been to get to this place right here where we're going to be studying tonight. I just want to kind of go over a quick uh, review of what we found in this letter to the Romans. So stay with me here. So the basic message that Paul is giving is that he's speaking to a Jewish audience of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and a Gentile audience of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And One of the issues that he's having to deal with is the place of the law, the place of the law of Moses in our relationship with Jesus Christ, both as Jewish believers and as Gentile believers. And so that's what he's trying to discuss. He said this, he says, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him for the death he died He died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So that's one of the main things he wants us to understand is that we were in Jesus when he was on the cross. He died on our behalf, but not only did he die on our behalf in the eyes of God, we died as well. We died to our old self. We die to our old nature. When we're buried with him in baptism, that is a sign that we've died to our old life. And so what he's trying to tell us here is that we should consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. We're dead to sin and alive to God. He also says this, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. And he spent a whole lot of time explaining to the Jewish believers they should not be putting their trust and reliance on the law for their relationship with God, that the law was not the source of their righteousness. The law could never impart righteousness to anyone. It could only bring the consciousness of sin and put us to death. So he's telling them, do not rely on the law. For your righteousness rely on Christ because the gospel is the good news that God has given us concerning his son that we are called to belong to Jesus Christ and we're called to be saints not through observing the law but through faith in the son of God and that's what he's trying to express to them in the earlier part of the letter he says we have been brought from death to life because of what Jesus did on the cross, and because Jesus rose from the dead. We are no longer in Adam. We have been changed from being in Adam to being in Christ, and now we live because Christ is alive. And he says, because of this, consider yourselves dead to sin and offer your members, and he's talking here about our physical bodies. He's talking about our eyes, talking about our ears, talking about our mouth, talking about our hands, talking about our feet. That's what he means when he says your members. He's even talking about our minds. Offer the parts of yourself. (laughs) We'll say it that way. Offer all the parts of yourself to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. And this is a very important point. We are not under the law. Now, that doesn't mean the law no longer exists. That doesn't mean that the law no longer has a purpose. It does have a purpose, the same purpose it always has had, and that is to identify sin and to make us conscious of sin. That is the purpose of the law. That's all the law can do, make us conscious of sin, but it does not give us righteousness. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. In the gospel, a righteousness from God is made known apart from the law to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God 
comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. And what is grace? Once again, grace is the favor of God. It's not being under the wrath of God anymore. It's being under the favor of God. So because of Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood for our sin, he became the propitiation. He is the one who turned aside the wrath of God from us, and he took that wrath upon himself, and now we have God's favor because Jesus took away the wrath of God that was justly against us. Jesus took it away through his cross so that now God can have favor on us and be just in doing so. So we are under the favor of God, and the favor of God gives us an opportunity. It's the opportunity to be transformed from the likeness of Adam to the likeness of Jesus. That's what grace is for. Grace is God's favor. It's God giving us an opportunity to be transformed from the image of Adam to the image of Christ. That is why God has given us his grace, okay? So he says, sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. We are to consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. We are not to let sin reign in our mortal bodies. Listen, you have a choice. Before you came to Jesus Christ, you were an involuntary slave to sin. You and I both were involuntary slaves to sin, and we were objects of God's wrath by our very nature. That's how we were before we came to Christ. But now that we've come to Christ, we are dead to sin and alive to God. We're not to let sin reign in our mortal bodies. He says, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. And I've got to remind us here who he's writing this to. He's not writing this letter to the world in general. He's not writing this letter to people who do not yet know Jesus Christ. He's writing to believers. He's writing to me. He's writing to you. And he's telling us that we are slaves to whomever we offer ourselves to. And we have a choice to offer ourselves to sin and become slaves of sin or to offer ourselves to God and become slaves to righteousness. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one to whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? And this is still true today. It's just as much true after we come to Jesus as it was true before we came to Jesus. So what's the difference? The difference is before we came to Jesus, we didn't have grace. We didn't have favor. We were under the wrath of God. We were by nature objects of wrath. But now when we come to Jesus, we have grace. We have an opportunity to be transformed from the image of Adam into the image of Christ to be set free from involuntary slavery to sin and to have the opportunity to offer ourselves as slaves to God, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. And I said in a previous episode, there are no free agents in the kingdom of God. No free agents. We are not cut loose. We're not foot loose and fancy free. Just because we've confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, just because we've been forgiven of our sins by his blood, that doesn't mean now we're free to live however we please, that we're just free to control our own lives and make all our own decisions and, and just do whatever we feel like doing. No, we transfer from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We transfer from the world into the kingdom of God's dear son, and we transfer from being slaves of sin to being slaves of righteousness. And that's what he's saying here, all right? But thanks be to God that though you were once slaves of sin, you have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. So we're servants, however you look at it. We are either servants to sin or we are servants of God. Those are the only two choices you have. Those are the only two choices I have, to be a servant of sin or to be a servant of God. But grace gives us the freedom and gives us the ability and gives us the opportunity to choose to be slaves to God, to choose to be slaves of righteousness. That is the beauty of grace. Grace doesn't 
free us from all obligation of how we live. No, that's not what grace does. Grace frees us from slavery to sin and gives us an opportunity and gives us a privilege to offer ourselves as slaves to God. And not only that, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit so the Holy Spirit can come alongside and help us to give the members of our bodies as slaves to God in righteousness and in holiness. We have become slaves of righteousness, okay? We are no longer slaves to sin. We are slaves of righteousness. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Listen, even though you have confessed Jesus as Lord, even though your sins have been forgiven, even though you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, if you continue to serve sin voluntarily now, not involuntarily, but if you voluntarily continue to offer yourself as a slave to sin, you will die. You will die. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And what is eternal life? Eternal life is... This is the words of Jesus in John 17, 3. Eternal life is knowing the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. I'm going to say that again. Eternal life is knowing the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. So eternal life is not just a length of life. Eternal life is not just a never-ending life. Eternal life is a relationship. Eternal life is is knowledge, experiential knowledge, not head knowledge, but experiential knowledge of the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. We are debtors to the Holy Spirit who gives us life. And that's what we talked about last night, how that we have an obligation. We are debtors, but not to sin. We're not debtors to sin, to live in sin, but we are debtors to the Holy Spirit who gives us life. For those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Okay, now we're ready to get into our our passage to study tonight. And I said, this is what Paul's been aiming for, to get to this place right here, because now he's explained the, the relationship between Jews and Gentiles. He's explained the relationship to the law. He's explained the relationship to sin, no longer being a slave to sin, but being a slave to God. He's explained all that. Now, remember when I told you that whenever you read this uh, letter of Rome, letter to Rome, that you needed to keep in mind that Paul's always speaking to two audiences, that he was speaking to the Jews, and then he was speaking to the Gentiles who had become believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, now as we get to this part, he's talking to both audiences. He's talking to both of us. And he's saying to us this, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, the Israelites who had had the promises and the covenants and the the law, and they'd have the priesthood and the sacrifices, they understood what sacrifices were all about because Whenever they wanted to draw near to God, whether it was the thanksgiving or, or, or praise or whether it was for sin or whatever, they would bring a live animal to the priest at the altar and the priest would slit the throat of the animal and the animal's lifeblood would flow out while the sinner or the person had their hands on the head of the animal identifying their life with the life of that animal that was that was being killed, that was giving up its life, not to take away their sin, but to cover their sin, to cover their sin, not to take it away. The blood of bull and goats cannot take away sin, but it would it would be a reminder that they deserved the wrath of God for their sin, but God was not putting his wrath upon him. That was grace as well. Being able to have that whole system of sacrifice where their sin could be covered was an act of God's grace as well. It was God's favor toward them. So what he says here, now instead of bringing an animal to a tent or to a temple or to an altar, you bring yourself. And instead of cutting your throat, your lifeblood spilling out on the ground, you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. In other words, the body stays alive, 
but the body's not free to do as it pleases. The body is given over as a sacrifice to God. My tongue belongs to you. God, my ears belong to you. God, my eyes belong to you. God, my mouth belongs to you. God, my hands belong to you. God, all the other parts of my body belong to you. And that's what he's talking about here, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And then he calls it your spiritual worship. This is worship, friends. Worship is not singing songs. Worship is not jumping up and down. Worship is not sitting quietly with your head bowed silent. Worship is offering the members of your body as a living sacrifice to God. That is spiritual worship, and that's the kind of worship that God wants. Jesus said, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, for those are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Offering our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, is our spiritual worship. And then he goes on and tells them this, do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world. Listen, the culture and the values and whatever's trending in this world is not what we're to pattern our lives after. This world is fading away. This world is passing away. Every generation is different than generation preceding it, and every generation after ours will be different than our generation. This world in its present form, which is the form in which we experience it during our lives on earth, this world in its present form is always passing away. So that's why he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So see, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and I've said this before, so I'll try not not to belabor it. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, your spirit, your human spirit, the inner self, the inner you is set free, is delivered. That's what salvation means to deliver. It is delivered from the power of involuntary slavery to sin. You aren't forced to sin because you can't help it. You're set free from sin, and you receive the Spirit of Christ. Your human spirit is born again from above by the Holy Spirit. You receive the Spirit of Christ, which identifies you as belonging to Christ, and you are a member of the body of Christ in your spirit when you believe on the Son of God. That's what happens there. That's the new birth. But there's more to your life in the Lord than the new birth, just like there's more to human life than being born. What would you think if a woman went to a hospital and she went there because it was due for her to deliver the baby and she gets into the delivery room, she delivers the baby, she stays long enough to get all that needs to be done, done, and then she gets up and she just walks out the door, goes on home, leaves the baby in the nursery. You think, well, what's wrong with you? <laughs> what's going on? And she says, well, you know, I just came to have a baby. I, I did that. That's what I've, I'm done. I, I came to deliver a baby. That's what I did. But there's more to motherhood than simply giving delivery. <laughs> there's more to fatherhood than simply giving conception. There's a process of living that follows it. And it's the same way here. It says, do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. We need to have our minds renewed by the Holy Spirit so that not only are we set free from involuntary slavery to sin, but we are also set free from the power and the and the practice of of sin. The new birth sets our spirit free from involuntary slavery to sin, and the renewing of the mind sets our mind free from the practice of sin. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing. Now, why by testing? Well, because we're no longer under the law. The law is not our guardian anymore. The law is not our supervisor anymore. The law is not our teacher anymore. Well, who's our teacher? The Holy Spirit is our teacher. The Holy Spirit leads us and guides us. We walk in the Spirit so that we won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. That's why it's testing. No matter where we're at in life, no matter what we're doing in life, we are always to be sensitive to the inner voice of the Holy Spirit within us. Now, 
If we need to know whether or not something is sin, we can go back to the law, and the law will identify whether or not something is sin. There may be some times where it's not quite clear whether a specific thing is a sin or not, and we can even go and study different scriptures and try to gather different scriptures together and and, and to discover a principle that will help us identify sin. That's a good practice as well. But even then, sometimes it won't be fully clear A lot of the times it will, and sometimes it won't. When it's not, then that's when we lean on the Holy Spirit. By testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought, but to think with sober judgment. That's serious thinking, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Listen, my hand is not my foot, my ear is not my eye, my mouth is is not my stomach. (laughs) We have different parts of our body, different members of our body, but all of them still together are us, one person, one body. So in Christ, there are many members. Every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is a member of the body of Christ, and the members do not all have the same function. The goal is not uniformity. That isn't the goal. Uniformity means identical, just identical to each other. You can't tell one. If you've seen one, you've seen them all. That is uniformity. That isn't what the Holy Spirit is attempting to accomplish in the church or accomplish in our life. What he's attempting to accomplish is unity, and unity is different from uniformity. We may get to that a little later as well. So though we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given us. We're not all given the same gifts either. Let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Then he says this, let agape be genuine. Now, hold on a minute. That wasn't the word you were expecting, was it? Well, there's a reason that I use that word, and I'm going to show you here in a minute why. What is agape? Agape is a verb, not a noun. It is a word of action, not a word of identification. Agape is compassion. What is compassion? Compassion means to be moved with feeling to meet a need. Compassion is not sympathy. Sympathy means you can understand what a person is feeling. Compassion is the willingness to relieve the suffering of another person. He doesn't call us to sympathy. He calls us to compassion. One of the greatest examples of this is in what we have come to know as the Good Samaritan, the story of the Good Samaritan, where a man had fallen among robbers on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. A priest passes by on the other side of the road. A Levite passes by on the other side of the road. Jesus doesn't judge the reason why they passed or condemn them. He just simply takes notes. That's what they did. But a Samaritan sees the man lying on the road, and he has compassion on him. And Because of his compassion, he is willing to relieve the suffering of the other person. And not only that, he was willing to take the risk that there might be robbers waiting behind a tree somewhere for him to stop and to go over there and to attack him as well. So he was willing to take a risk. Agape is willing to take a risk. You notice how there's no ooey gooey mushy feelings involved here? We are called to agape God. We are called to agape one another. That means we are called to be compassionate. We are called to be willing to relieve the sufferings of others. That means we are willing to take risks. All right. And not only that, agape spends itself on behalf of others. Not only did the Good Samaritan stop and bind up the guy's wound and disinfect the wounds and bandage them with what he had of that day, which is oil. Not only did he do that, he took the man to a safe spot on his own donkey and he put him in an inn and he paid for the inn. And then he told the innkeeper, if it costs you anything more between now and the time I get back, just keep tabs on it and I'll pay you. For whatever it costs you. So agape means it spends itself on behalf of others. So 
What does that have to do with our scripture here tonight? Paul instructs them, both the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers, let agape be genuine. And this is part of our spiritual worship as well. This is actually what we do with our members. When, when we offer our members as a spiritual sacrifice in worship to God, this is what we do with our members when we offer them to God. We let agape be genuine. We abhor what is evil. We hold fast to what is good. We agape one another with brotherly affection. We outdo one another in showing honor. We're not slothful in zeal, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. I mean, it's not like, oh, well, I guess so, if I have to. Fervent in spirit. Lord, you mean to tell me I have an opportunity to serve you today? I have an opportunity to offer the members of my body in service to you, and you accept that as an act of worship? Hallelujah. I'm ready to go. Let's go, Father. That's what he's talking about here. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Listen, we should be helping one another. And later on down the road, we're going to get into to New Testament giving and receiving, New Testament sowing and reaping. But he's all he's he's already mentioned here that here at the top, the one who contributes, some people have the gift of giving. Now, that doesn't mean that the only ones who should give are the ones who have the gift of giving. That's not what that's saying. But some people have a, are especially gifted to give, and they should contribute in generosity. But then he tells all of us down here before, I mean, down at the, up at the top, that's somebody who has received, by God's grace, a gift to contribute, okay? That's a gift they receive by the grace of God. But down here at the bottom, this is talking about everyone. This is talking about all of us, rich or poor, no matter what. We are to contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. He says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. You see, that's that's part of the compassion. You, you, you share in what they're going through. You share in the suffering. You share in the loss. You share in the need. But then you go beyond that. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, And what God provides you with, you help meet the need. You help alleviate the need in the name of the Lord. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Tell you what, that's more important than having all our doctrinal I's and T's dotted. He says live in harmony with one another. Remember, it's not about uniformity. It's about unity. Well, how do you get unity without uniformity? When love covers a multitude i may not be perfect in my doctrine you may not be perfect in your doctrine but we share a common faith in the lord jesus christ we know that he died for our sins according to the scriptures we know that he was buried we know that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures we know that we have redemption through his blood we know that we're justified by faith and we place our trust and our confidence in him And if we share that faith with one another, then we have a basis for unity. But what about what you believe about communion? Doesn't have anything to do with unity. What about what you believe about water baptism? Doesn't have anything to do with unity. Well, what do you believe about this? What do you believe about that? What do you believe about the other thing? Doesn't have anything to do with unity. Unity is based around the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ and our faith and our commitment. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. All right, do not be haughty. Don't think you're better than other people. (laughs) I'm not either. But associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil. But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And see, this is where a lot of us fall short sometimes. We, We get so individualistic in our faith that we think, well, it doesn't matter. Other people doesn't matter. All that matters is me and Jesus. I don't want our song is just Jesus and me. No, it's not just Jesus and you. It's not just Jesus and me. It's Jesus and me and the other members of his body. It's us. It's us. Repay no one evil for evil. Give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. You might as well face it. You're going to run into people. I've run into people. No matter how hard you try to bend over backwards to live at peace with them, they just aren't going to have it. They need some kind of a healing. They need some kind of a deliverance because they're not willing to live at peace with other people. And that's just the way it is. If you don't believe it, just look on Facebook or Reddit. 
and you'll you'll see it real quick, especially if you get in into the groups that discuss Christianity at all. You'll see that not everybody is willing to live peaceably with others. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord, to the contrary. And these are just Paul repeating the words of Jesus. If your enemy is hungry, if he's thirsty, give me something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There are some un- online preachers and teachers, one I'm thinking of in particular, that I he, sometimes I'll hear this guy on the radio and I don't know who he is because I don't listen to him very often. And I'd hear him on the ra- radio and then I'd find out who he is. And all of a sudden I, I was sitting there going, mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. and then I find out who it was and I'm going, Rrr. why? Because there's just one area where him and I are in total disagreement and I don't think he's, he's even open to the Holy Spirit on it. And so I get frustrated with the guy. Well, let me tell you something. If I saw that man fall down across the street, if I saw that man or hurting or thirsty, I'd forget my doctrinal differences with him in a split second. And I'd go over there and I'd lift him up and I'd give him something to drink. I'd bind up his wounds. I'd help him. I'd have compassion on him. I'd agape him. Why? Because he's a member of of Christ's body just as I am. He doesn't look the same as me. He's a different member of the body. My hand doesn't look like my foot. My elbow doesn't look like my ear, but it's still members of the same body. So I would go over there and I would minister to him. I'd be compassionate toward him. Even though we're not uniform, we can be in unity through the love of God that's shed abroad in our hearts by faith. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now he starts addressing something else because even though spiritually we are in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now, our spirit has been redeemed, our spirit has been set free, has been delivered from involuntary slavery to sin, our soul and our bodies are still on this earth and we still have to deal with people and situations on this earth. So now he begins giving us some very practical instructions on how we're to deal with the things on this earth. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. Those who resist will incur judgment. Now, what is this talking about? This is talking about, in general, the civil laws that we have that govern us in a society so that we can live together in peace and relative safety. We are to submit to the governing authorities. But there is a limitation to that. When Peter and the apostles began preaching in Jerusalem the gospel of Jesus Christ and declaring in the gospel the resurrection of Jesus, the ruling people of that day, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, demanded that they stop preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus. And what was Peter's response to them? We must obey God rather than men. When it comes to civil society, when it comes to living in peace with all men, we submit ourselves to the governing authorities up until the point that the requirements of the governing authorities contradict and fly in the face of what God has commanded us. That happened all the way back in the days of Daniel. Imagine that if you were kidnapped here in America, you're a teenager, you're 15 years old, and you were taken to, let's say, Iran. You're an American. You grew up in America. You have enjoyed the privileges and the prosperity of growing up in America, but then all of a sudden you're kidnapped and you're forcibly taken to Iran. And now you're expected not only to live in Iran, you're expected to work for the Iranians. You're expected to work and help them run their government and make sure that you work for the advantage of the Iranian government in Iran. How would you feel about that? I bet most of us would not feel very good about it. Most of us would refuse. But that's exactly what happened to the prophet Daniel. He was kidnapped from his home in Israel. He was taken to Babylonia, and he was forced to serve in the government of King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the king of the people who kidnapped him and exiled him from his homeland and he worked for their benefit all up until a certain point and that was the point Darius put Daniel in charge of almost the entire kingdom and 
the others got jealous of Daniel and made a, a, up a law that the king wouldn't allow anybody to pray to anybody, to any god or anyone else for a certain amount of time except the king himself. And Darius thought, well, hey, you know, that sounds like a pretty good idea. Here, give me a pen. I'll sign that law. So he signs the law. And what did Daniel do? Daniel went to his room. He opened the windows of his room that faced Jerusalem, and he got down on his knees and he prayed to the God of heaven. And then all those jealous friends were spying on him to see what he would do. And they said, ah, we got him now. And they went back and asked the king, hey, king, didn't you sign a law saying that nobody could pray to any other God except you for so many days? And Darius said, well, yeah, I did. I did sign that law. Well, Daniel is praying to a different God than you. And the king knew that he'd been tricked. When they said that, he knew that they'd done it on purpose, that they'd tricked him. And, but the king had to honor the law. He had to honor his word. And Daniel got cast into the lion's den. But God shut the mouths of the lions, and they didn't harm Daniel. We are called to be subject to the governing authorities up until the point where their demands violate what God demands of us. We have to obey God rather than men. You see, the thing is, we live in a world of tares and wheat. We live in a world where there's a mixture of good people and a mixture of bad people. The reason that we have human government is to restrain and protect us from the evil people. Because the good people, you don't have any threat from them. They're not going to do anything to harm you. It's not the good people you have to worry about. It's the lawless people. It's the people that want to oppress and impose their will upon others. They're the ones who need to be restrained by the government, the looters, the rioters, the people that break the glass windows in the department stores and the hardware stores and the small businesses, the people that are out on the streets destroying and vandalizing and, and threatening people and injuring them and killing them. They're the people that we need government because they need to be restrained and they need to be punished. Whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. And then he says this, pay to all what is owed them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. Owe no one anything. Try to do your best to stay out of debt to the world. The more you can stay out of debt to the world, the less power and control they have over you. I'm just going to end that there. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. And I didn't change the word here, but that's the word agape. Let's read it again. Owe no one anything except to agape each other. Be compassionate. Meet the needs of others, even at your own expense. Take the risk of helping another person. Except to agape each other. For the one who agapes another has fulfilled the law. So see, there's, there's how we fulfill the law. We don't fulfill the law by trying to observe the law because no one can be made righteous through observing the law. We are only made righteous through our faith in Jesus Christ. So in order to fill the law, what do we do? We agape one another. For the one who agapes another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall agape your neighbor as yourself. I have some videos on my YouTube channel about agape. I didn't get them all done, but I'm going to release them here soon. Even when Jesus was on the earth under the old covenant, under the law of Moses, and he was asked, which is the greatest commandments in the law? In the Old Testament, not the New Testament, the Old Testament, Jesus said the greatest commandment in the law is to agape the Lord your God 
with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to agape your neighbor as yourself. The law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Rather than what kind of food you eat, rather than what kind of stuff you drink, rather than what kind of clothing you wear, rather than what day you consider sacred, and what day you consider like any other day. No matter, that's not what fulfills the law. What fulfills the law is this, you agape the Lord your God, and you agape your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong. Agape does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, agape is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Now, wait a minute. I thought we were already saved. I thought, you know, I thought we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and confessed with our mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in our heart, God raised him from the dead, and we're saved. Well, yes, we are. Our spirit is saved. Our spirit is delivered from the power, power of involuntary slavery to sin. But remember, we still have a mind and we still have a body. Our mind needs to be delivered from the practice of sin. That's what being transformed into the image of Christ is all about. We're not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our mind. And then our bodies need to be delivered from the penalty of sin, which is death. And Jesus gives us the promise of the resurrection. Salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believe. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the podcast tonight. And, uh, you know, now we're getting into the meat of what Paul was really wanting to write in his letter to the Romans. He wanted to get past any misunderstandings about their relationship to the law. He wanted to get past any misunderstanding regarding the difference between Jew and Gentile. He got that all out of the way at the very beginning so that he could focus on this, what we're reading tonight and what we'll be reading from this point forward about the way we serve God in this world as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, set free from sin, set free from the law, and given the promise of the Holy Spirit, how we walk in the Spirit so that we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, and how we are led by the Spirit so that we become the sons of God. Heavenly Father, I pray for my friend tonight that you will minister to them a spirit of wisdom and revelation from God so that they may know you better. Lord, draw them near unto you, as they draw near unto you. And Father, help them to be built up in the knowledge of the Son of God. If there be any sick among them, touch them with your healing power. Deliver and set them free. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, amen and amen. Well, praise the Lord. That's it for the podcast tonight. We'll see you again on Monday. God bless you and have a great Labor Day weekend.